In today's show, I'm going to be joined by Chad Ford, the one and only Chad Ford NBA Draft Insider. We're going to be talking about the NBA Draft, of course. We're going to be talking about Isaac Okoro, Yudoka Azabuki, Denny Avdia, plenty more as well. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it. Indeed. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. As I said today, we're talking to Chad Ford of the uh, Chad Ford NBA Draft Big Board Show. So we'll, uh, you can check out that podcast as well and check out all of the great shows across the Locked On Podcast Network. A couple of announcements though, again, my Discord server, the notes are in the, uh, or the link to it is in the comments, in the description below, and in the show notes. Join it. We've got hundreds of people in there already talking fantasy basketball. It is, uh, it's popping off, as the kids like to say. So join that Discord server. If you're looking for leagues to join, there's a link below to the FBI Fantasy League. So join those ones as well. And if you've got some time, throw a vote for Locked On Fantasy Basketball for the Podcast of the Year Awards in the Australian Podcast Awards uh, section. So check that out. There's a link to that as well. That'd be great if you could do all of those things. And quickly, the Locked On uh, NBA mock draft is starting today. It's awesome. I was on it as part of the main desk of that show, analyzing all the picks and talking about the draft. It's going to be fantastic. So check that out for the next five days on Locked On NBA. But now it's time for me to bring in Chad Ford so we can discuss some prospects in this NBA draft. All right, let's bring him in. Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right, so Chad obviously is a part of the Locked On Podcast Network with his own show, Chad Ford's NBA Big Board. So go and check that out. But we're going to talk about prospects like we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, talking to plenty of draft people about prospects that they like, prospects that they they don't like quite as much as others. And Chad is no different. And Chad, the first guy you want to talk about is someone who's really interesting to me because of the insane defensive numbers that Paul Reed put up at DePaul. Paul Reed is a 6'9", power forward. He's 21 years of age, but he averaged 2.6 blocks, 1.9 1.9 steals, which are insane type of defensive numbers. Big rebounding numbers as well. I guess the concern, Chad, there is his shot. But like, how do you think that this stuff can translate? I do. And in fact, you know, if you compare him to the other big uh, player that can guard maybe four, maybe five positions on the court, Precious Achua, I, I, I don't understand why Paul Reed uh, isn't isn't the better prospect here. I mean, you first of all, statistically, his defensive numbers are better. And then I think even though I, I would agree with you that offensively, there are some questions. He only shot 30% from three. You know, is, is his offense going to be enough to really translate at the next level? It's, it's already, in my opinion, far ahead of where Precious Ochoa is right now. And the other interesting thing about Precious is Precious doesn't know he's a bad offensive player. He thinks he's a good offensive player. He, 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 there isn't a shot that he doesn't like, where I think Paul Reed does play within himself and does not try to do too much to me, in, in my opinion. You know, whether he ends up you know, being able to spread the floor you know, offensively, I'm not really sure. But defensively, to me, He's a no-brainer in this draft. And because he has more offensive potential than I think Precious does, I personally don't understand why he's not in the conversation in the 15 to 25 range. I I think there are a couple of teams that see him there, but it it looks more likely that for most teams, he's a second-round pick. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So I've got him ahead of Precious as well, but that is in the minority opinion. I've got Paul Reed as a bit of a later first-round guy, but if anything that he does it defensively translates across, then he is going to be value there. And the guy that I have sort of tried to compare him to in terms of coming out of college is someone like Paul Millsap, who was a, a second round player who didn't really have the shot in college, but the defensive stuff obviously translated across to the NBA. And then the shot started to develop a few years later. So he is an interesting player like that. There are you know, real concerns with the shot mechanics, but the defensive stuff's yeah, really, really intriguing, and yeah, I'm 100% with you in terms of having him above of, of Achua. Now, 
you mentioned yeah, you'd have him yeah, in that 15 to 25 sort of range. So some other big men who might be in that range, we'll get Archway out of there. But guys like um, Jalen Smith, who's probably in that area as well. Xavier yep. Tillman could be in that zone as well. Yeah, would you see him above those two guys? Uh, personally, uh, the answer is I do. I don't think that, that that's the general consensus among NBA teams. I think Jalen Smith for sure will be of those bigs that you just mentioned, likely the first one off the board. Uh, you know, his ability to stretch the floor is, is so attractive to teams. I think there are questions defensively for Jalen Smith, which is, which is why I personally think Reed is a, is a, a better prospect, but but clearly Jalen Smith is well ahead of Paul Reed on the, on the offensive end. I, so I, you know, if you're talking about what bigs, where they I actually think they'll go in the draft. I think that Jalen Smith for sure would, would likely go ahead of, of, uh, uh, of him, Paul Reed. I think precious probably goes ahead of him. Frankly, just, you know, talking to NBA teams, Pokashevsky, if you want to call him a big man, I mean, he's tall, uh, but he's really skinny probably goes ahead as well. Um, and then, you know, Paul Reed's going to be in that mix, uh, you know, with Zeke, uh, for example, or, uh, you know, someone like Isaiah Stewart, um, someone that I actually think is, is someone who I actually think could sneak in there as well as Vernon Carey Jr. Uh, out of Duke, uh, someone who has lost, depending on who you ask, 30, maybe 35 pounds uh, since, the, since the season began. And it just looks much more athletic and looks much better, especially on the defensive end, the last few months, and have gotten teams excited about him again. Yeah, because he was a guy that, that fell, uh, Vernon Carey, this is, fell quite a bit during the during the season, during the college season. He averaged 18 points per game, but there were some defensive concerns there with him. Like I've, The listed weight I've got for him here is 270, so you're saying he's dropped down from there? Yeah, 238 is what I was told. Well, okay, that's a, that's, that's a huge, <laughs> huge difference. Now that's gonna obviously help to improve his mobility. Uh, and some of his yeah, perimeter stuff d- defensively. Uh, in terms of Carey and, and the shooting, like if we're comparing him to Reed, which one of those two do you think is more likely to develop a reliable three-point shot? Because Carey did shoot 38%, but it was on 21 attempts. So we're talking really low volume. It was, and, and it wasn't his role at Duke. But I again, now I'm starting to rely on intel around teams that have worked him out and have seen him post his college career where they're trying to remake his body trying to remake his game right now. And on those ends, I think that he looks much more promising ahead of where Paul Reed is right now. In fact, I've had several teams told me he's shooting the lights out uh, in, in workouts. And that's something that's really attracted to him. I mean, you know, one thing that you could say that, you know, is, you know, he doesn't have the, the greatest length in the world. Uh, right. And so, you know, that's somewhat of a concern, but you know, he's 6'10 and, you know, at 6'10 with a seven foot wingspan, if he is going to be mobile and you know that was a major major question mark at him duke where he looked much more like the centers of a bygone era you know the jalil okafor types uh if if that's the case and and he can keep that weight off which is always a question mark uh, then he becomes a much more intriguing prospect because you're talking about one of the top 10 high school prospects in the country coming out of his senior year high school Another guy that you want to talk about here is another big man, and that is Yudoka Azabuke out of Kansas. He is seven foot tall. He's 21 years of age. Uh, a guy that you know, 10 years ago probably would have been thought of as a, as a top 10 pick. Uh, blocked 2.6 shots per game, uh, almost 10 and a half boards, 14 points per game, a four-year player here in college. Now, he's a guy that I think is probably more likely to go in the second round, but do you think that is a significant value if a team does get him in round two? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think he's valued in the first round. First of all, he's a seven footer with a seven, seven wingspan, a seven, seven wingspan uh, that, that he's, he's a monster, um, right? He shot 75% from the field at Kansas as a se- senior. He, he is going to, when he gets the ball in the paint, he's going to finish. He also is an explosive player athletically. He tested as one of the best athletes uh, in the draft at the recent uh, combine as well. And so you, you, Take all that together. Now, look, he's a terrible free throw shooter. I don't expect much more from him offensively than putbacks, catching the ball in the paint, uh, and dunks, right? You're not, you're not going to necessarily see this guy go out and start shooting threes or, or, or shooting on the perimeter. He doesn't have that sort of game. But, you know, we're also talking about in the late first round role players. 
We're not talking about guys that we're drafting typically that are going to be starters uh, on your team. And it's it's hard for me not to imagine that at his size and his length, his strength and his athleticism, that he doesn't have a long career in the NBA as a backup center, if not a starting center. Chad, the NBA draft is just days away and uh, unlocked on NBA. We're uh, mock drafting the entire first round. You were involved in that. I was involved in that as well as part of the main desk over there. And I'm not going to give it away to say whether as a Buke was picked in the first round in that mock draft. But hey, if you want to find that out, listen to it. Listen to Locked On NBA over the next five days and you'll hear the projections of each pick. Expert analysis from yourself, Chad, from John Hollinger of The Athletic, from Sports Illustrated, Jeremy Wu, plus myself, David Locke, uh, Brad Rowland and Brendan Clean on the main desk over there. Don't miss a pick. Subscribe to Locked On NBA today, wherever you get your podcasts. And Chad, Built Bar, it's the best tasting protein bar ever. They are back with six new flavors, cookies and cream, cherry bar, sea, carrot cake. cake. What's your uh, what's your favorite flavor of Built Bar? I like the coconut. Okay. Uh, you okay. Know, maybe it's maybe it's being in Hawaii or whatever, <laughs> but I love that that toasted coconut flavor uh, was my favorite. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a cookies and cream man over here, but if you are looking for these bars, which are high protein, low calorie, low carb, low sugar, Built Bar, they are the best for you and they taste just like a candy bar covered in 100% chocolate. The six new flavors join the original 12 flavors. And if you go to BuiltBar.com and use the promo code Locked On, you get 20% off your next order. So use that promo code Locked On for 20% off at BuiltBar.com. Now, when you said about Azubuke being a poor free throw shooter, you weren't exaggerating. He shot 42%. 42% on over 300 attempts in college. Now, that is, that's not bad. That is absolutely horrendous. We've seen players who were that bad, DeAndre Jordan, Andre Drummond, improve to be 60 to 70% free throw shooters, weirdly, after about eight years in the NBA. Is there anything with Azubuke that would make you think that he can become just bad instead of uh, historically horrendous? <laughs> He's got, a, he's got a long ways to go just to get to bad, right? I mean, this is like Ben Wallace territory uh, that we're looking at right now um, with him. That's a long way to go. I mean, look, can people learn how to shoot free throws? Yeah, do a lot of big men typically do it? No, they, they typically, what, they're, what they are in college is what they are um, in the pros. But it's definitely a skill that can be taught. Uh, and, and you think about it, you're, it's, it's kind of hard sometimes to wonder why this is the hardest skill. But I think there's a psychological factor here with free throw shooting because you're in your head, right? Like no one's guarding you. It's not within the flow of an offense. And I think so much of it has to do with psychology uh, as opposed to, you know, the sort of natural instinct, which is why I think sometimes the, the bigger training that has to happen isn't necessarily in your form. It's what's going on between your ears. Yeah, absolutely. I think psychology, it's probably the, the biggest part of free throw shooting and just getting, because you hear the stories all the time. You know, Dwight Howard hits 80% of free throws in practice and you know, it just doesn't happen when he's out on the court with people watching with uh, the pressure of the game situation around him. And uh, yeah, as a BK has got a long, long way to go there. Now, after those two guys that you like, let's talk about a couple of guys that you're not as high on. Let's start with the small forward out of Auburn. Isaac Okoro, 6'6 wing, who has been projected anywhere in that top five to at the back end of the top 10, a guy that's generally considered the best perimeter defender in this class. Uh, first of all, would you agree or disagree with that? Oh, absolutely. I think he's probably the best perimeter defender in the league. He also is probably, among the perimeter wings, the worst offensive player so, uh, of the group. And so he's a, he's a feast and famine sort of prospect. And if you're taking him at 10, 11, 12, 13, I don't really have a problem with that in this draft because of the value that he gives on the offensive side. But it's really hard when you hear that the Cavs are considering him at five, uh, for example, or the Hawks are considering him at six. When you look at the other prospects on the board, because I just don't know whether that shot is gonna come along. You look at the free throw percentage, you just look at him offensively, it, there's a big curve there. This isn't just like tweak a few things and Okoro becomes a great um, offensive player. There, there's a lot that's going to have to happen. I mean, I love the athleticism. I love the intensity with which he plays the great game, the grittiness. I have zero doubts that as a, as a lockdown defensive player, um, he's got a role to play at the NBA. But I think you want more than that out of your fifth, sixth, seventh pick in the draft. And that's why, in my opinion, he should be somewhere, you know, in the teens as opposed to somewhere at as high as five. And, I, you know, I felt the same way about, you know, DeAndre Hunter last year, uh, you know, for example. And uh, 
you know, there's, there's not that there isn't a skill set there that's intriguing, but a skill set at that high in the draft I, with that big of a weakness concerns me. I'm glad you brought up DeAndre Hunter because, yeah, not to spoil too much from the Locked On NBA mock draft, yeah, the, the guys were talking about you know, Okora being the best perimeter defender in the class. And I said, well, you said the same thing about DeAndre Hunter last season and nobody would be taking him as a top five pick again this year because that offensive game just didn't come around. And Okoro is a worse shooter than DeAndre Hunter. And yeah, examples can be thrown out. Oh, look how much Jimmy Butler improved as a, as a playmate maker and as a shooter look how much Kawhi Leonard improved yeah, but they, they are the outliers and in general you could then throw all well, Michael Kidd Gilchrist or DeAndre Hunter and they don't become good offensive players and I think Okoro has got some passing ability he's a strong finisher but you're right if you're picking up that high you'd hope you're getting a little bit more than a guy that's a good defender and even then he averaged 0.9 steals per game and, and steals aren't the indicator of being a good defender, but you'd hope that someone whose game is, you are the best perimeter defender in this class, that you can at least be a defensive playmaker to go along with uh, some of that shutdown ability. Now, he was a guy that was able to just stop the ball coming his direction as sort of like a, a shutdown corner type of situation in football, but there are still some concerns. There. So I think I'm with you on that. I'm not sure I'd have him in the teens, but I don't like him as a top five, top six type prospect. And look, you know, Kawhi Leonard uh, slipped in the draft in part because of that, right? He went in the late lottery. He didn't go five or six. Jimmy Butler went 30th yep. uh, in the draft, right? And Michael Kidd Gilchrist, who I liked, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. I loved Michael Gil Kidd, Kidd Gilchrist for many of the same reasons that someone might like Okoro, right? Uh, the, the athleticism, the grittiness, he's a winner. I mean, I loved Michael Kidd Gilchrist. I, I applauded when they took him too. I think I've learned my lesson. Yeah, that's uh, as well with prospects like that. Yeah, that that's and if he'd gone well. 10, 12, 15, we would feel different about Michael Kidd Gilchrist in his career. Yeah, absolutely. Because you get a rotation player at pick 12, then I think you're okay with it. Like someone who can you know, start some games, who can play seven, eight years in the NBA at a competent enough level, you feel okay about it. But when you're picking them at two or picking them at four, and then they turn out to be your fifth best starter on a fringe playoff team, like that's that's not good. And I think that there is a risk there, definitely, with Okoro. I can uh, I can see that 100%. Um, the other guy is, that you're a little bit down on here is Denny Avdia, a 6'9", small forward, 19 years of age. Another guy that's been talked about as a top four guy that maybe maybe the Chicago Bulls are looking at at pick number four. The Warriors have said they like yeah. him, yeah, although they've said they've liked nearly everybody in this draft. And the concern with Avdia is the shooting, a guy that can't even hit 60% of his free throws. Uh, and that's a concern for a wing guy. The, the three-point shooting, like cutting, fantastic. Finishing, fine. He can pass. But to me, he's a guy that's okay at a number of things and bad at a couple of things. And I, I'm a little bit with you. I, I don't see any superstar uh, type upside here for uh, Avdia. But again, in this class, is, is that enough to be a top four pick? Are you hearing that he's a top five sort of guy? Yeah, some teams like him in that in that range for sure. Uh, he's ten on my board. Uh, he could go higher. I've had him as high as you know seven at one point. I certainly think that those those are realistic. A realistic projection to him is probably somewhere between five and ten. Um, you know that's that's probably where I would put maybe four and ten. You know, here's the thing: that for those exact same reasons, first of all, it's the Luka Doncic syndrome, no. right? You see this international player like Doncic. You want to find the next guy like that. Who's a guy out there that does some really interesting things? He's and and, and are there some similarities between them? Yeah, I think there's some similarities uh, between them as well. But Doncic was doing it against the best competition in Europe every night. That was not the case, uh, right? For um, for Denny, he barely got minutes um, and had had pretty weak production for Maccabi Tel Aviv when they were playing EuroLeague games. It was all done in the Israeli league, which is just frankly not that particularly strong of a league. And, you know, there's other things beyond the shooting. He actually shot okay for three. So if people are like, well, you know, he shot like 39% for three. He had a hot run right uh, after COVID yep. uh, for the eight games where he, he shot the ball really well. We look at his free throw percentage, like you said, a, a sub 60%. That is the much bigger tell sign um, typically when we look at analytics, he also has a six, nine wingspan and six, nine. So he doesn't bring any length to the table. That's a concern for me. And while I love his aggressiveness, this is a player that plays with a chip on his shoulder. He's got that swagger, uh, to his game. I'm not sure that the talent is there to take that to the next level and have that right in the Israeli league. Yeah, you can do that. I'm not sure that he can have that swagger 
at the next level. I'm not sure he has the game to back that up at the next level. And when you have players that sort of have that mentality and then they get to the league and they start getting frustrated, that aggression starts to come out in different ways, which aren't just really aren't helpful. Yeah, he is a, an, an intriguing one because you see, you see some of the stuff he does, some of the yeah, aggressive cuts to the basket and the timing of that, and, and it can be really good. And defensively, he's got that aggression that you mentioned, but there are obviously worries about how this translates. And it, is he, it, as I said, is he a fourth starter, a fifth starter, a sixth man? In Do you want to waste that high-end capital on a player who probably doesn't have your super high upside? Uh, I did have him at number four in my last mock. I'm probably going to change that when I do my next one after this, but yeah, it's it's so hard to sort of gauge where he fits after yeah those first couple of guys that um, yeah and, and with the concerns about yeah how the shot looks and some of those other issues with him that it it is a real worry about where he ends up in the NBA now. The next couple of guys I want to talk about, just some other players that we haven't spoken about on the show yet. And this is a guy that gets a lot of buzz. Jaden McDaniels from Washington, 6'10", forward, 20 years of age. Um, I think it's fair to say he was pretty disappointing in college. Uh, Big things were expected out of McDaniels. He averages 13 points. He blocked 1.4 shots. He shot 34% from three. And there's been talk of yeah, him being someone that, that goes in, in the top 20. Whereas I'd say if you watched his college production, you wouldn't want him really anywhere near the top 30. Uh, so a lot of teams, I guess, enamored by the physical skills and, and the body with McDaniels. Okay, first of all, do you think, are you hearing that he is going to be a top 20 pick? And do you believe that that's where he should be? Very polarizing prospect, right? We talk about upside. And after James Wiseman and LaMelo Ball and Anthony Edwards are off the board, if you were to, if you were to ask me who are the next you know, two or three players that have the most upside, I'd probably say Patrick Williams. Uh, I would look at RJ Hampton and I would look at him just on pure upside, like what he could become. He is also of all of those players, the furthest away from reaching that potential and that upside. I, I think it is very fair to say that he had a very disappointing season at Washington and major, major question marks about do tools translate into actual game production, right? It's one thing to have the tools, physical and and skills. It's another thing about whether they actually translate into five on five basketball. And from what we saw at Washington, the answer certainly is feeling the skeptics around Jade McDaniel. So what is he doing now? He's going into workouts. He's in a workout setting. All of a sudden, all those tools start popping again. And you start to see all of these things that he brings to the table that are truly intriguing at a basketball player with his size and his length and everything else. And so then you start to say to yourself, you know, maybe it was the system. Maybe he's going to mature. Maybe he's going to play into that. And so where is the risk reward for a player like that, right? At what point do I say, look, I understand this guy has a scary floor and he may be out of the league in two years, but if he hits, he could hit big. And, and am I willing to take the risk um, for that? And I think the sort of appropriate place for that to typically happen, especially in this draft, is probably sometime right after the lottery. I think at that point, you've exhausted the guys that their upside and combined with their risk reward factor is, is high enough that you can justify them not taking him. I think starting at pick 15, he should be in the mix. Now, could he end up 25 or even 30 in this draft? Yeah, because teams are all over the place on him. And all it takes is a team to like one guy a little bit more uh, than him for him to start sliding on the board. So I don't really know where he'll go. But if you told me that the Orlando Magic take take him at 15, for example, that actually is in line with what we've seen uh, uh, John uh, uh, Hammond do multiple times in his stints in Milwaukee and in Orlando, um, swinging for the fences for a prospect. I don't know what the outcome will be for him, but he's intriguing enough as a basketball player that I I don't think the risk is that high. It's not like you're going to pass on a superstar uh, at 15 or 16. Oh, that's, I think that's for sure. There's not going to be any guaranteed superstars around that area of the draft. Um, I don't really see it with McDaniels, but I can understand the the uh, idea to take a swing on the upside with a player with those skills. I'm just uh, pretty pretty low in terms of confidence that anything actually comes of it. But if you are looking for that swing, yeah, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with making that pick. It probably isn't the direction that, that I would go with it. The last guy I want to talk about here is... 
Uh, Devin Dotson, the point guard from Cam- Kansas, six foot two, 20, uh, 21 years of age. He uh, averaged 18 points per game, four assists, shot just 31% from three, which is a pretty disappointing number, but the 2.1 steals do stand out. Um, of course, teammates with uh, Azabuko, who we mentioned earlier. Dotson seems to be a relatively common early second round pick. Do you think he's got a, a chance of being able to, to stick in the NBA as a uh, as a backup point guard? Yeah, you know, it, he, he more is a Lou Williams type uh, to me. Uh, you know, that's that's who he reminds me of in certain ways, you know, because he's small. And and that's one of the things that obviously, you know, at 6'2", 185 pounds, he, you know, as a wing, he's, he's, not a, he's not a big basketball player. Jordan Clarkson is a little bit bigger. But this, this guy that comes in and he's instant offense, because look, he's relentless attacking the basket. He's, he's one of the quickest players off the ball in the draft. Um, or sorry, on the ball. And he can get pretty much wherever he wants to get on the floor. And and because of that, he's going to be able to score the basketball. He's a streaky shooter. I think the mechanics are pretty sound. Um, and he has that ability to get, get separation because of how quick he is. But, you know, the streakiness is a question. The, the lack of size is a question. Um, but, you know, when you think about a guy that's a pure scorer who had a lot of success at Kansas last year and can play point guard in a pinch, I think that, you know, he's an interesting prospect in the late first round as a guy who could be instant offense off the bench for you. And so I'm a little higher on him than a lot of people are. Uh, I'm, I'm not like, you know, he should go in the teens higher, but I think once you get into the twenties, I could make an argument for him being one of the few guys that could probably step in. I mean, given his speed and quickness and his relentless relentlessness on the offensive end provides some excitement for you off the bench. So if we talk about some guys who might be in that area, then you've got you know, Malachi Flynn, Tyrell Terry, uh, Josh Green, um, Teo Maladon, Nico Mannion in that sort of 20 to 35 range. Like, Where would you have Dotson there, like ahead of most of those guys? Um, in that range, you know, I have I have Malachi Flynn pretty high, uh, you know, at 23 right now. I'm a, I'm a pretty big believer. Uh, Leandro Bolomaro, uh, I have ahead of him right now. Um, you know, Cole Anthony is an interesting one. Uh, you know, there's some things that I would say are similar about Cole Anthony to uh, Dotson, and you could make an argument either way. Cole Anthony's a little bit bigger, shot it, shot it better. Um, I'm not sure that he he doesn't have the speed uh, that Dotson does. You know, Josh Green is one of the, the most difficult, and you know, you're from Australia, and maybe you know him better than than anybody of of where he goes in this draft. I've had team people tell me that he's going to go in the teens, like like right after the lottery and people tell me that he's a second round pick he's been one of the hardest guys for me to really peg where he goes in this draft because he, he's one of those players that looks like he does a lot of things well but i'm not sure that he does anything great and where does he sort of hang his hat on at the next level yeah green uh i think it's got to be defense because the shot i don't think it's ever going to happen the finishing is rough uh, i think he's got some vision in terms of passing but it's just defensively, uh, he can be there as a rotation wing player. I could see him going to the Bucks at 24, uh, sort of like a Sterling Brown type replacement player if Brown decides to move on in free agency. But in terms of a guy that's going to be a solid enough NBA defender, I think there's a, there's room for him, but the offensive game is pretty rough for, for Green at this point. Interesting. But yeah, look, he could go at, at 16, he could go at 35. Like, I feel like once we get outside the top 12 or 13, there's about 30 guys that are all you know, relatively equivalent. There's, uh, there's very little in terms of the difference between those players. In this draft chat, I've, uh, I've kept you long enough. We've spoken about draft prospects here. It's been fantastic to talk to you. Um, you've got NBA draft big board going on at the moment. What's happening over on the show? I. Uh- well, we're going to, John Hollinger and I are doing a redraft in 2019 and trying to see if there's any tea leaves that are going to help us. Uh, John Hollinger and I just broke down a bunch of trades. We're going to have a new mock draft that's going to come out on Friday, new big board that's going to come out on Thursday. And then Tony Jones is going to come back with us on Monday. And we're going to do our draft here, something that I've, I've done really for about the last 20 years at ESPN, breaking the draft down by tiers the way that a lot of ABA teams doing. So a lot of great content coming in the next few days. So go, you're already following Chad on Twitter. So go, don't worry about that. I'm sure you're all over it, but go and check out the new podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, Chad Ford's NBA Big Board. Uh, check it out. And Chad, thank you for coming on Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Hey, thanks for having me on, Josh. Really appreciated it.
And that'll do it for today's show. Uh, we thank Chad again for coming on tomorrow. I'm going to have ESPN's Kevin Pelton on to talk about the NBA draft, and then we're going to be doing a mock draft to round out the week. Great podcast right across the Locked On Podcast Network. As I said, mock draft over on Locked On NBA, and all of the individual team shows are doing great stuff. Uh, Brad Rowland at Locked On Hawks, tons of draft work. Um, just all the teams, whatever you want to find out, the Locked On Podcast Network has you covered. Don't forget, guys, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube. Leave a comment down below. Tell me what you thought of today's episode and uh, check out the links for the Discord, for the Podcast of the Year, and for Fantasy Basketball Leagues. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.